season. I really enjoyed it. And uh, I've definitely kind of thrown myself in now into consulting on GDPR projects. And I'm really enjoying it. Um, and I also listed my cats because that is the most important thing is that I have two very large, very annoying cats. So if they jump up on my desk during this, uh, that's that's who they are. So um, yeah, I'll do a quick rundown um, on GDPR, but not too much time because I'm sure you're all super aware of that. Uh, what Pardot is doing, uh, what we can do to get in, into compliance, um, and who am I going to market to when you know I can only have opted in prospects? What am I going to do? Don't worry, there is plenty. Um, but really to preface this, um, a lot of people ask me, you know, do part of Salesforce comply with GDPR? And I just want to say, you know, different legal teams are going to interpret compliance obligations differently, and you can configure part of Salesforce based on those. So there are really there are a lot of moving parts. You know, there's going to be different geographical um, things to think about depending on where your prospects are based. Um, there's going to be a lot of like a lot in your tech stack that that needs to be considered and, and included in your privacy policy. Um, but I'll call all of that out as we go on. And as always, this is my Salesforce safe harbor statement, guys. I'm not a lawyer, um, nor is this presentation a magnus opus on EU data privacy. And it's not legal advice for you to use in complying with EU data privacy laws like GDPR. Um, I just know how to make the tools you use work in the way you want them to, to comply with the laws that you have. So always consult your lawyer. With that said, I also want to give a shout out to the different types of, um, of verbiage that, are, that is generally used because people think of GDPR and their head goes to email marketing. I want to make it really clear that that's very far from the truth. Um, you know, all of these privacy laws that, that we see in these different countries generally are split into two two sides of the coin. So you've got your data privacy laws, which GDPR falls under, that's all to do with the data you have and how you process it. And then you've got your email and communications laws. So in the EU, um, we have the um, privacy and electronic communications regulation. So, um, or the e-privacy directive. So these are two very different types of legislation, but they do kind of bounce off each other. So I'll make it really clear like which one I'm talking about. And Pardot has its own law. It has its permission-based marketing policy. So this has gone, even though obviously Pardot is a US company, they have gone above and beyond can spam law by requiring opt-in and prohibiting buying email lists from third parties. So maybe they've even gone above and beyond GDPR, right? Because they're pretty they're pretty strict. Like those of you who use Pardot, you know, the three strikes in your out rule, if you get more than 10% hard bounce, they don't let you purchase lists. You can't um, import team-based emails into Pardot unless you go and ask for permission from Salesforce. So they do a really good job of, uh, of making sure that you're in compliance with this stuff. But now GDPR, so I'm going to really quickly run through a refresher on what this actually means. So on the data privacy side, we have a lot of rules around list management, needing a legal basis for processing data. You need unambiguous opt-in. You can't pre-check that box on the form, guys. They have to check it of their own volition. Um, and you can't grandfather in data. You also need to document everything you do. That's super important. Um, users can request uh, data that you have on them. They can request to be forgotten. Um, and you can get some serious fines. So really important to make sure that your data is in compliance. On the other hand, we have the e-privacy directive. So this is in the works to become a regulation to sit alongside GDPR. This is going to apply to companies who call, email, or use cookies with their prospects. And this is really specific to email marketing. So you're going to need specific consent to send email. This needs to be called out. Um, there is a soft opt-in uh, for current customers. So you can market them with messages about products that are similar to services they've already purchased. Um, you can't disguise your identity and you must provide a valid contact address. Um, so the actual GDPR deadline, so when the original laws came into effect back in 2018, 
what actually happened? Because this is what we expected, right, guys? It was all over the news, headlines everywhere. Everyone was like, ah, everything's going to burn. Um, actually, it kind of tapered off. And let's be honest, we all forgot about it, didn't we? But now we're all working in marketing and, and GDPR, you know, compliant world. So we need to really be thinking about this stuff. But when we actually look at the impact and the fines that have, uh, that have actually started to come up, what we're really seeing, it's not to do with email marketing. Like when you look at the first recorded data breach, like the first recorded fine, this was in Sweden and it was about um, the use of facial rec recognition technology used in a high school without consent. And you know, the, the people sued, um, sued the school on behalf of the students. Um, and then like you look at Google, they have the, the very unwanted title of being the first victim of one of the biggest GDPR fines, um, 50 million euros in France for failing to make their data processing statements easily accessible, uh, for employing obscure language in their privacy notice, and for not seeking consent to use prospect data for ad targeting campaigns. So as you can see, it's really about when it comes to GDPR compliance, it's really about your data. It's about being super transparent with what you're doing with that data, calling out on your privacy notice and making sure your prospects are super aware of that. And when we look at, you know, how many times the term email actually appears, it's just once. The only other mention of something pertaining to email in the entire legislation, and I've read it, guys, it takes a while, would not recommend, like, get the, get the cliff notes, um, is a mention of direct marketing, i.e. email, being a reasonable use of personally identifiable information. So it really isn't concerned with your spam email, it's concerned with your data. And the reason it's concerned with data is because of the rights that it establishes for individuals. So you've got personal data, uh, which is anything related to an identified or identifiable data subject. My favorite color is green. It's actually not, it's purple, you can tell from the chair. Sensitive personal data. So this is going to be anything that can be connected to um, personal information um, that you know can can say something sensitive about that person. So some really good examples would be if you're asking somebody for their t-shirt size because they're attending an event, that's personal data because you can infer health information from that. Um, if you ask them about meal preferences and they say that they're halal, you can infer religious information. So what you really need to be doing ideally as a marketer is capturing that data separately and not having it connected to the personal information. You can have a form that connect that, that collects like t-shirt sizes and meal preferences um, in an anonymous form and not have you know that data connected to an email address. That's that's perfectly legitimate for an event. Um, so I would always recommend, you know, under kind of data minimization requirements, only ever have the data you need to do the job that you need to do. If you don't need any more, if the event has passed, delete it. There's also pseudonymous data. This is a really tricky one. So this is important because um, the majority of data we have is likely to be tied to people as opposed to accounts. So to give an example of why this is, this is important. Um, if you have a CRM record with someone, even if it doesn't have an email address, um, not that that would happen in Salesforce, but just let's, let's, let's go with this. Um, say you have a job title of CEO, they have a vertical of manufacturing, and they have a town or specific geographical location. You could go to that town and you could make a reasonable assumption as to the identity of that person based on the businesses there and who that CEO is. Therefore, that data is now sensitive because it can be used to track someone. So this is, yeah, this, this is a really tricky one um, because honestly, in today's connected world, truly anonymous data does not exist. So what we really need to be thinking about with our data is do I actually need it? Uh, what do I really realistically need to do my job? You know, this is why things like having data cleansing um, as part of your kind of quarterly marketing review is really important. 
Um, and then kind of moving towards the email side now, um, there are six legal bases for processing data and only two are going to apply for marketers. And that is legitimate consent, so a typical opt-in procedure, and legitimate interest. This is the gray area, guys. It says you can process personal information with a valid reason, um, as long as there is little privacy impact. So yeah, it's a real gray area, but a really common one I see for this is, uh, for example, if you are hosting an event and somebody talks to a salesperson and gives their business card, they've not explicitly opted in, but that is kind of legitimate interest because they have, um, they've had that conversation. So you just need to be really careful um, and have some way of recording why you think you have consent so that you can, if somebody makes a, a request to have the data that you have on them, you can be really transparent about how that relationship developed. But then looking at what types of data we have that are important, um, cookies, Cookies count as data. Um, GDPR only mentions cookies once, and it states that if you can identify an individual via their device, it's considered personal data. Um, these days, you know, everyone is cookied, Pardo has cookies, um, it is considered personal data. So that is something to be aware of. So the next thing I wanted to look at was how to actually start complying with GDPR. And this is where I'm going to start jumping into Pardo specifically. So the main ones that we've looked at so far are documenting your internal processes. Um, a, a really good one I would recommend is conducting a data privacy impact assessment for any new technologies. Um, if you're part of a business that maybe acquires other businesses, this is one to definitely keep on your radar if you're consistently acquiring new technologies into your stack. Um, certain types of businesses do need a data privacy officer, so I'd recommend you know, checking with your uh, legal team if that is a concern of yours creating privacy policies and compliant contract terms, making sure that that information is accessible uh, to any prospects on your website, and reporting obligations when a data breach occurs. Depending on where you're headquartered or what, what countries you operate in, always know your reporting obligations because those are super important. If any data you know, gets out any way, whether it's like a lost laptop or something online, you need to know when and how to report that. But there are a lot of misconceptions about GDPR. So um, some common ones I'll really quickly spin through. Uh, if you're US based, um, it's all about where your prospects are located, not where you're located. So that's a misconception, it still applies. Um, if you have data grandfathered in, then um, there's no grandfathering with GDPR. Any data you had before GDPR still needs to be compliant. Um, your data in Salesforce's servers. Uh, it doesn't matter where it's hosted, you own it, therefore you are uh, in control of that data. Uh, you are responsible. Um, the, I need to hire a data protection officer. This depends again where you are, uh, where you are based, where you operate. Different rules apply for different countries. Um, I need a double opt-in process only if you have prospects in Germany, Switzerland or Austria. I mean, it can be considered best practice because you're building trust by affirming your prospects want to hear from you. And it's great for data quality because junk email addresses won't therefore get captured in your system. But you only need double opt-in for those three countries. That said, what is Pardot doing about this? So those of you who work in Pardot will know we have the cookie banner. So admins can request visitors opt-in to tracking on a per country basis using the Pardot banner. Uh, we also have the right to be forgotten with Pardot. So remember, once somebody goes in the recycle bin, they're not going to get deleted. They're not going to get tracked, but they're still going to be there and Pardot will recreate them if they have uh, some sort of engagement with you, if they click a link or fill out a form. So we actually need to permanently delete them out of uh, the recycle bin. And remember, if somebody makes a right to be forgotten request, you need to delete them everywhere out of your marketing stack, not just Pardot. So any other tools you're using, they need to vamoosh. If they're a customer, you can keep as much information as you need to be able to do the billing process, but any marketing information needs to be gone. And then the other thing is business units. I don't know if some of you guys have, have looked into this, but um, a couple of articles in GDPR cover data minimization requirements. I've mentioned this a couple of times. We only need as much data uh, 
as we need to do the job we want to do. So we need to minimize our data and not keep data we don't need. And a lot of this is to do with controlling access to that data to the people who actually need to use it. So of course we have like marketing data sharing settings in Facebook. Uh, in Facebook, what am I talking about? In Salesforce, oh my God, my brain is not working, it is later. But business units do a great job of this because it allows you to kind of split out um, and decide who can see what in Pardot. So I think this is going to be really powerful, especially for kind of like global enterprise businesses um, who have teams in different countries and want to control that split. I do actually have a blog on like regionalizing Pardot inbound. So I'll totally uh, let you guys share that on Twitter once I've written it because I find this fascinating. But then on to how to actually get in compliance in Pardot. So some frequently asked questions I tend to get are going to be things like, um, is an email address personal data? Yes, because you can identify someone with it. They usually contain people's names. It's definitely identifiable. Uh, will keeping limited data limit your exposure? Uh, yes, because data minimization requirements are a thing. Um, prospects attending an event, yes, it can be legitimate interest, but please try to get consent. Um, is opting out the same as the right to be forgotten? Uh, no, because if you have contractual obligations, you can keep them for billing purposes in your CRM or, or your billing system. Um, but if they opt out, it just means you can keep their data, but you cannot send them marketing information. Um, and then when do you need a double opt-in strategy? Germany, Austria, Switzerland that's when, but also can be considered best practice. So some action items for you guys to get into compliance. So the way I like to look at this is design, document, decide. We need to be designing an affirmative opt-in process or just a, an explicit opt-in process in our marketing stack. Um, I recommend using a mix of custom fields, automation rules and updating conversion points, making sure we're capturing that information, sending it back to the CRM if necessary. Uh, document, start documenting your marketing and lead gen policies. Make sure that is super clear. Um, update your privacy policy with any information about processing. Um, GDPR does recommend that you have verbiage in your privacy policy about automated data processing. Pardot does automate um, that processing, so it's important to call that out in the notice itself. Making sure you have a cookie policy um, and making sure you have a data protection officer or a privacy uh, manager who is responsible, uh, has ownership of that if required. And decide, decide if you're going to regionalize your policies or adopt one policy across the board. That's a really key one for global businesses. And then to really break that down, um, considerations and things to look at in Pardot, check your forms. You know, do they state what information will be collected and how it will be used? Do you have an explicit opt-in box that is not pre-ticked to be able to capture that consent? Your emails, do they review or link to the privacy notice? Um, are you using an email reference center? Uh, have you indicated that any subscription options in your, uh, in your preference center um, are there for marketing purposes? Do you have any fields sensitive in nature? Is the data current and accurate? Is there anything you can remove? Access, are all of your users current and necessary? Big plug for Salesforce user sync. It's so much better um, if you are using Salesforce and you're on the V2 connector, I want to say, uh, then user sync is just an absolute no brainer. And are all places and systems that process this data documented? Like, do you have a completely holistic view of your entire marketing stack and how data moves between those systems? And then you're probably thinking, oh my God, Chloe, how am I going to do all of this and still have a single person I can actually email? That is what my clients always say. They just totally freak out. But there's so many things you can do. You can ask for consent on any points of lead conversion. You can um, automate adding new clients and active prospects to your mailing list and make sure you understand what legitimate interest looks like for your business. Make sure your privacy notice is referenced literally everywhere. There is not too much referenceability there. Like just put it anywhere you can possibly link to it. Um, make sure your email preference center is set up correctly and it allows for really selective unsubscribes. And then make sure that you have an email footer that is asking people to opt in, linking to your preference center. Um, but yeah, 
So I tried to kind of like run through that. I'm aware that's, that's a lot of talking, a lot to take in. Um, does anyone have any questions? I might have answers, but also I'm not a lawyer. <laughs> Hi. Oh my goodness. That was so entertaining. I think <laughs> I you're the, like really, and, and Tom even said it in the comments as well. That was really entertaining and really good overview of GDPR. Probably the best I've ever heard, to be honest. So. <laughs> And also we loved your, uh, your comparison slide of the two types of, so you had the, the data privacy and the email, the, the marketing privacy, the marketing yeah, legislation. Yeah. yeah. That was a really good way to lay that out as well. Um, so if anyone missed that, that's a good resource to have on hand. Yeah, yeah. That's, that's a really good one. Cause it really just split them out. There's actually a few I need to add to this cause there's some stuff happening in some other countries, but. You can be yeah. our go-to person. <laughs> so um we did have one question um i'm just conscious of time so i'll ask this one um so this was from someone who said i'm interested in seeing how we can cater for explicit opt-in and opt out opt-in and i suppose opt oh, oh, opt-in and opt-in date for pardot and i assume opt-out date as well um what would you propose as a solution for that um, it's in capturing the date at the same mm. time. Um, typically, just trying to like think on my feet now. So typically yeah, I'd nice. have an additional field. So kind of like a date of consent field. Um, that's just, uh, so I'm telling Pardot to um, fill it with a date when that opt-in checkbox is ticked. So I don't typically use the actual, um, the opt-in checkbox that comes with Pardot or I'll, I'll edit the default. So I'll have um, like a, almost like a multi-select as opposed to having a yes or no option because I also want it to be able to be unchecked. So I can say either a prospect has specifically opted out, they've specifically opted in, or I don't yet have consent and the mm. box is blank. So I would have those three options. And then if somebody ticks that box, um, I would have an automation that's completing an additional field with a date when that happens. And I would also sync that back to Salesforce. So I think it's really useful for salespeople to understand when and how their prospects have, have opted in um, if you are sharing data with Salesforce, um, because what I wouldn't want to do is have a salesperson not know and then reach out to a lead like cold um, when they've already opted out from receiving marketing and, and they have to complain. So yeah, there's a few different things you can do around fields and making sure that you have that that captured in part of. Amazing. Thank if, you. Sorry, if I can, if I can just jump yeah. in there as well. I saw, I saw you come off on um, you. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's, it's a polite signal, isn't it? It's like putting your hand up. Um, I, yeah, so w one thing that I like to do is, yeah, include things like a completion action on forms with submission date for those, um, for that custom field of when did they opt in, um, and also an opt-in location. So again, with a completion action, on the form to say the specific form there that they opted in from. Um, yeah, depending on how compliant they'd like to be. Great, Yeah, that's, that's awesome. Yeah. And I think, so thanks, Chloe. Thank you so yeah, much for that. And um, it's so good that we've recorded this as well, because I think it's going to be a real reference for everyone to go back to. Um, like I said, the most entertaining I've ever heard. So 